So, Jerry, how quick can somebody bleed to death? Quickly. Three minutes. Even less, depending on where the injury is. Welcome to the Urban Defense Podcast. I'm Dwayne Urban, the owner of Urban Defense LLC. Along with me is Andrew Saller from Saller Lord, Ernst Berger, and Inslee. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a very important survival skill set, and that is emergency trauma care. And our special guest today is Jerry Hines. Welcome, Jerry. Gentlemen. Hola. Yes. Good to see you. So Jerry is a uh, retired firefighter and paramedic. Uh, he also is a retired police officer and served as the TAC medic on the team back in the day, uh, a man that I trust implicitly. And so Jerry, uh, you're going to be talking today uh, with us about emergency trauma care. So tell us a little bit about Jerry Hines. Who is Jerry Hines? What's your background? I got out of high school, went right in the military. When I got out of the military, I went into the fire department. Did a 30-year career there and retired, sat around a couple of years, got bored, decided I needed some action, went into the police department, did that. Right out of the academy, I was approached by the SWAT team. They were in need of a medic, so I went on the team as a medic. Subsequent to that, I got on to the uh, public order team, the riot squad, whatever you want to call it. Right. The civil right. disturbance team. Yes. I don't know. Yes. Um, worked at the academy, teaching classes for them, and uh, helped with the TECC program, Tactical Emergency Casualty Care. So all the, all the officers in the agency, from the chief on down, have been trained in that. That's it in a nutshell. So you're a selfish man who wanted two careers. One just wasn't enough. One is never enough. One is none and two is one, right? There you go. There you go. So what are you doing now? Now I'm traveling and fishing. And uh, What kind of fishing? All kinds of fishing. Getting ready to go to Florida in a couple weeks, fish with my grandson. And uh, I like snakehead fishing, bass fishing, any, anything. All, all local or uh, uh, all I travel. I travel, yeah. Okay. Right. We go out to Montana every July and try to do some trout fishing out there. Okay. Good times. All right. I'm jealous. So let me ask you this, getting right into the uh, topic of conversation. What is the difference for what we do now compared to what we did in years past as it applies to emergency trauma care? Why, why has there been a change? What is that change? So most medicine nowadays is coming out of the battlefield. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. But they've made significant strides in patient care. I remember when I was 11 years old, I joined the Boy Scouts, and one of the first things they taught us was first aid. And they talked about things like tourniquets and controlling bleeding and things like that. And that type of um, treatment has changed significantly over the years and it's all backed up by medical studies. I remember one time I was sitting in, a, in my dad's car waiting for my mom to come out of the grocery store and it was during the winter time and an uh, elderly person came out of the store, slipped and took a fall on the ice. So they called the ambulance and the ambulance crew showed up, and they had their ties on and their soft covers on. Horse-drawn mm -hmm. carriage. <laughs> Horse-drawn carriage. Yeah, now I'm dating myself. Yes. And they <clears throat> scooped the patient up, threw him on the stretcher, put him in the back of the ambulance, closed the doors. Both attendants got up front and drove to the hospital. So was this one of those ambulances that looked like the Ghostbuster mobile? Something like that. Okay. It wasn't, like, like, it wasn't like the traditional ambulance that we're used to today. No. Okay. No. And the hat went blowing down the 
parking lot in the high winds and the ties are flapping them in the face. But having said all that, um, the medic crews nowadays are trained in significantly higher uh, treatment modalities and they carry a lot more equipment. I mean, it's high speed stuff, but so, medicine is always changing. So, and exactly. So it's, it wasn't just what they were wearing that's changed. It wasn't just the equipment, the vehicles changed. And as, as we find better ways to do things, we adopt those better things. When Correct. they, like they say in the tactical realm, when things change, things change and things are always changing. And you have to adapt with the change. Absolutely. So what would have been done now that wasn't done then in that scenario you just called for us? So they would have immobilized the patient. What's that mean? Uh, put them on a backboard, put them on a, put a collar on, cervical spine collar. Uh, someone would have rode in the back on the way to the hospital, took a set of vitals, done a complete patient assessment, rendered whatever care that was indicated. A little bit different than what you saw on that wintry day? A little bit different. A little bit different. And why do they do it this new modern way? Why is that better? Well, as time goes on, treatments change. You know, they, they do studies, um, and they determine that, you know, this is effective, but this is more effective. So they tweak it. So essentially, you, going back to what you said, you talked about a lot of this comes out of the battlefield. Correct. And uh, so they found more effective ways of treating people, and, and one of those is how they more effectively treat bleeding injuries, massive bleeding. Correct. Uh, finding, if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but finding that stopping that massive bleeding is helpful to life. Right. So when you're taking, uh, su suppose you take a CPR class, they talk about, you know, you can stop breathing for up to six minutes with little to no brain damage, but you can bleed out in as little as two or three minutes. So you want to stop that bleed if it's a hemorrhagic bleeding. You want to get that under control quick before you address anything else. What the Boy Scouts taught you long ago, are those still the same procedures we want to employ today? The, they're basically the same procedures. Um, the tourniquets have changed a little bit. Improvised tourniquets aren't quite as effective as commercial-grade tourniquets that are now being used by professionals. So who benefits from this training? And it's, you know, I think we, uh, we lose sight of the fact that this is important stuff, not just for somebody that has a gun, not just for a concealed carry holder, not just certainly for soldiers or police officers, but who? Everyone, right? Everyone. Everyone who lives. Everyone who lives. Everyone who is possibly going to be involved or around a critical incident. Which could be anything, anywhere, could anytime. Be, correct. It doesn't have to be a stab wound or a gunshot wound. It can be a car accident or somebody falling down the steps. Um, if you have some training, it helps the patient as well as the provider when you go in and start doing hands-on for that patient. Let me ask you this, as it applies to massive bleeding, the amount of time, how important is time when it comes to stopping the bleed? Time is essential. So what, in your mind, obviously it de determined, it's determined based upon the, the type of the bleed and how much uh, blood they're losing, but, and maybe even the size of the person. Right. So small people, more important than larger people, right. maybe? Well, obviously a small person. I'm not a doctor, I'm, Andrew, I'm, so I, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm curious. Are you saying I have more blood than Dwayne? You, you may. I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> well, you're I'll the expert, say, I'll say so. the adult yes. has a little bit more blood volume than a pediatric patient. Okay. Okay. All right. But having said all that, um, stopping that bleed <laughs> is critical. So the point to what I just said being that a person, a lay person, being able to stop the bleed as opposed to waiting for medics to arrive, it will likely be too late at that point when medics get. You want to stop it yourself if you can. Right. So what we had talked about a while ago was, you know, people go out and they decide for whatever reason they want to purchase a handgun. And so they purchase that gun and then they contact you and they come and get some training on that, how to how to shoot the gun, how to operate the gun, how to clean the gun. All those things are important, but what's the next step? And then they might sit through your class and say, well, what other classes do you offer? And you say, well, we have a concealed carry class, and then they come and take that. But between the time of you purchasing the firearm and, God forbid, you get into a critical incident, 
where you have to use your firearm, what, what occurs? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's where he comes in. So in, in our state, if you use your gun, you're going to be having some contact with the police department. You're going to be having some contact with the court system. But between that critical incident and you going to court, what, what occurs? Right. So if someone is injured and bullets go both ways, if someone is injured, what's your plan? Are you insinuating the enemy gets a vote too? The enemy gets a vote. So, so no, but you're absolutely right. Look, uh, if we look back at uh, 2013 Maryland when the new gun laws were taking place and things like that, and all these folks, they flocked out to buy all of these guns that they figured were going to be banned, and they bought handguns and AR-style rifles and things like that. And they bought them, and they bought maybe a couple boxes of ammo, and they stuck them in their closet, and they said, good enough. And they missed the critical component, which is what is your skill set, what is your training, and how are you keeping your training up to date? Um, so you're right. People, they'll go to a, a basic handgun class. They'll get their handgun qualification license in Maryland where they'll get some basic training in, in another state. Uh, they'll go maybe get training, uh, if required, for wear and carry or they'll take a few more advanced things. But they forget about the other aspects of it. It's not just that. It's stuff like understanding how to deal with injuries. Because remember, in those classes, maybe you're talking about how to put holes in someone. What happens when a hole gets put in you right. or a hole gets put in someone that you care about? Now what are you going to do? Correct. And if you have not practiced, if you have not received some sort of training, and then it's important to say, too, you don't get to go to training like this once in your life and say, got it. This is something that it's a use it or lose it, in my opinion. It and is. It's a perishable skill. Absolutely. And so going back and getting some sort of we call it in-service training, but some sort of training uh, a year or two or whatever down there, it's important to keep your skills fresh. Right. So your company is now offering a class, mm -hmm. emergency trauma care, Absolutely. and we cover all types of injuries. We do not cover medical issues, mm -hmm. heart attack, stroke, diabetes. We don't cover any So we're not Narcanning people. We're right? not Narcanning people okay. in the class. That's okay. correct. Not yet. No. But what we are doing is we're going to control the bleeding, We'll show you several different ways to do that. How to determine which treatment is appropriate for the type of bleeding you're seeing. Right. We talk about controlling the airway, maintaining the patient's body temperature, which is critical. And, you know, basic trauma care is what it is. So, so let me ask you this. Lots of scenarios. Right. Lots of hands-on. Right. Well, and that's important because just sitting there and hearing lecture and PowerPoint is, is one thing, but actually physically being able to put hands-on uh, is, is absolutely crucial. And, you know, we talked about it before we actually started to, uh, to film, and we were talking about the class, and, and uh, this is not something that someone needs to be afraid. Somebody goes, I'm 70 years old. How am I going to participate? Literally, my son participated in the class and Correct. put a tourniquet on me Correct. and was able to successfully do so. He did. He did a phenomenal job for a 10-year-old. Yeah. But then the only thing that I'm concerned with, some of the scenarios require you to get down on the ground. So if you have disability issues, mm -hmm. my advice would be to call you, mm -hmm. contact you via email, and we'll make a determination whether or not we can fit you into the class. We can curtail the training or customize the training, but there are certain things that you absolutely need to be able to do. Right. You've got lessons for everyone. Is that a fair statement? Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty and much. just because I was in the Boy Scouts and I got my first aid merit badge 20 years ago, right. I could use a refresher? Everybody could. I mean, I still stay current with my training. Oh, it's the same with firearms. It's it's the same with anything. If if you don't use it, you lose it. Correct. And um, perishable skills, uh, something this critical. And and people, you know, they'll call me all the time and they'll say, "Okay, we went to your whatever class, uh, or we went to some other class. What are your recommendations?" And um, not to make this an infomercial, but the uh, the recommendations are something like the two-day class, which is the, the defensive handgun class where we talk about tactics, the law, the, the what should you do, what shouldn't you do type of stuff. But you can't just have that without having stuff like this 
And of course, I'll tout, which will be another topic of, of discussion at, at a future podcast, is our force on force reality based training program, where you actually build that muscle memory, you build your judgmental skills. Um, and to, to me, it was very interesting when we run these, uh, even folks that come through that, that, you know, I have prior knowledge of that I'm like, this person's pretty squared away. We see a lot of feet glued to the ground in that first scenario, right. a lot of freezing. Right. Um, and it just goes to the point that you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Right. And simply thinking, oh, well, I'll be able to handle myself in one of these situations is not enough. Right. It's, it's really not enough. So let me let me say this. Have you ever heard of the term or the, the phrase rather? There's no medicine in a gunfight. Of course. Yeah. So what does that mean? Because we had a little discussion with a, right. a, a student on that. Go ahead. Tell me so, what that means. That phrase is generated by the mindset that when there's an incident going on, we're not so much concerned with stopping bleeding and securing an airway and things like that. We're concerned with stopping the threat. Yeah. Because we're, why? We're, because what could the threat do to us? Well, Stop us from helping everyone else. Right. We're trying right. to make the scene safe. Right. But at the same time, during training, your classes, the class that I'm teaching, we emphasize the fact that as you're addressing the threat, you're moving to cover. If you're wounded, you're assessing your own self, but you're still focused on the threat. Right. Historically, it's terrible, but what is the basis of this practice that's been introduced? Stop the killing. Stop the killing. And we, we live in a world where conflict resolution has become a lost art. And we see daily on the news, for no reason, people are involved in incidents that they didn't get up in the morning thinking about. And then this is where they find themselves. Yeah. Always have a plan. Yeah. You should always have a plan, and you should have a backup plan. Well, because Frequently, we find that our plans are not sufficient. Yeah, well, and what, to what Andrew said, <clears throat> the, in an active assailant situation, law enforcement's primary role is going to be to stop the, the threat to your safety. That means they're going to step over wounded people, women, children, whomever, and go to the threat to stop the threat. So what that means is if you're a layperson involved in that incident, maybe not in the back and forth with the bad guy, but you're there, and someone that you care about is being stepped over while they move to the threat. You're in a position, potentially, to help save that person. That's correct. While law enforcement stops that threat. That's correct. So, yep. Neutralize the shooter is going to be law enforcement's concern. That's the primary concern from the law enforcement perspective. Um, and, again, we, we've, we've, we've learned a lot. We've, we've evolved a lot over uh, over the years with the different active assailant incidents that have occurred. Um, and, yeah, absolutely. Um, they're going to move to stop the threat. So uh, if your thought is that they're going to stop to put a tourniquet on your leg, uh, that's not going to happen, not until the threat has and, we'll, and we talked earlier about bleeding, for example, right. and how quickly a person can bleed out. Yeah. When the days gone by where you had a problem, and you called for the police, and the police got there, and they set up a perimeter, and then they sat and waited for the SWAT team to show up to deal with whatever the incident might be. It's too late then. The days of that are over. Yeah, um, it's too late. Yeah. And again, like I said earlier, medicine, tactics, they're constantly changing. They're, they're constantly tweaking them to find out what's the best way to resolve this problem. Are we still sucking the venom out of snake bites, or where are we on that? Uh, I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> I think they actually make a little sucker for that, but I'm not sucking the, the, the venom out of anyone's snake bite. I, I don't even know if that even works. Do we know if that works? I, Mr. Producer, can you look that up and see, does sucking the venom with your mouth out of a snake bite do anything? While he's looking that up. That's not current best practice. I would, <laughs> you know, I would imagine in the days of COVID, you have to suck it through a mask. Right? Sure. Uh, you know, right. put your mask on, then suck the venom out. Right. Um, but he's gonna he's gonna look that up and tell us. I'm sure that there's a uh, hundred different Wikipedia uh, uh, posts that'll right. say one thing or another. So uh, we talked about uh, the the content uh, of the class that you provide uh, and the importance of of why somebody needs this information. Without uh, giving it all away, what, what are some, um, some bits of, of kit 
that are useful or things that we would uh, recommend, uh, we recommend in the class, obviously we'll go into greater detail in the class, but that you, uh, you see as, as absolutely crucial? So I recommend that people have training and purchase good quality tourniquets. So not off of, uh, not straight from China. Well, but probably everything's made in China now. Correct. But, so, but, but from a quality manufacturer. Quality manufacturer. I don't want to get communism in my bloodstream. <laughs> you, you may not have a choice. <laughs> Pressure dressings. Okay. You know, gauze, rolls of gauze, four by four gauze pads. Okay. Um, nasopharyngeal airways, chest seals, things like that. With the nasopharyngeal, uh, nasopharyngeal airways, what, what is the, why is the, are those preferred over the oral airways? Well, Gag reflex in the oral air, airway. Um, Can I just say, I think I'm a smart guy. What in the world is this thing you're talking about? It's, it's a rubber tube that you place in the patient's it, nostril. Yeah, it's a rubber tube that gets lubricated and inserted through uh, the right nostril, if I'm correct. Well, typically, that's where you start. Yeah, the, but the, if it doesn't work, you can use the left nostril. So it goes in your nostril. It's a long tube, and it goes down your nostril, and, and it goes down into your uh, breathing area, uh, your upper airway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds pleasant. It, yeah. Sounds yeah. like a it's, good Friday but, night. But if you have J a Jerry, will actually do it for ten bucks. No, sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, he I'll let you yeah. animate me. Yeah, we we actually have a um, we have a, uh, a a dummy for the class that we can use for that. But if uh, he he's offered before to uh, to do it live, but so I for gratuity, he's he putting yeah, the show on. I, but I I declined and said let's just do it on the rubber dummy. But at any rate. <laughs> And, and please stop referring to the rubber person as a dummy. <laughs> mannequin. <laughs> it's, it's, airway I have, mannequin. I have to call it what now? Is there a better it's a term? rubber person. A it, rubber it's, person. It's an airway mannequin. It identifies yeah. as a rubber person. Yeah, don't, okay. don't insult its intelligence. <laughs> Fantastic. I like to think I'm smart. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. If I was to take your class, would you tell me what's the good American-made, wonderful, superior products? Yes. The chi -com products? Yes. And you would help me get a kit together? We go over all that in the class. So, I don't sell those kits, but I can direct you to the websites that do. And, you know, at some point we may decide to put something together. We've had people ask. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's something we may look at doing. Uh, but, yeah, you can definitely steer them in the right direction. And, no, you don't need to buy the Gucci expensive uh, first spear uh, tactical bags. You and don't, things. but you do need to be proficient in your training. Right. And you should have a bag that allows you good access. Correct. Yeah. You should know where everything is in your bag. Don't open it and let it be a surprise. Well, that's... That, <laughs> and that's I've always... actually seen that before. Oh, I'm sure. So. I'm sure. So you're in a high-stress environment, and surprise, yes. and I open the kit up for the first time, mm. and uh, it turns out it's empty. Yeah. Okay. I have no rubber gloves. <laughs> rubber gloves are a good place to start when you're doing patient care. Now, if it's a family member and you know their medical history, okay. Come on, man! So, absolutely. Let's, let's be safe as much as we can. Absolutely. And, uh, and obviously, people are going to have different hand sizes, so you definitely would want a customized kit. If Correct. the glove does not fit, you must acquit, we know. <laughs> That's, my That's what they say. Um, so, I'll tell you what, though, let's talk about uh, legal liability, right? Okay. So, we, we've talked a lot about the equipment and the class and why it's important and all that. But I know what a lot of folks probably are thinking is, what liability do I absorb or place myself into by providing care to someone? Lawyers ruin all the fun. So obviously that would be Andrew's field of expertise. Right. So we hear a lot about something called Good Samaritan. Andrew, what uh, what can you tell us about that as it applies to medical stuff? So in Maryland here, we have the Good Samaritan law. Uh, it's going to be, for all the real nerds watching, 5603 of the Courts and Judicial Proceedings article. And it covers a situation where um, a person like me, not a person necessarily like Jerry, uh, encounters a situation where we might be uncomfortable and we might be worried, we're trying to help a loved one, we're trying to do all we can, but this is a situation where unless we have a lot of training and a lot of real world experience, uh, I'll be the first one to tell you, I've never treated someone for a gunshot. Uh, I might be the only one on this panel, that's the case, but I'm okay with that fact at the same time. So if there is a situation where we come across where that's happened, uh, there are legal protections for me in case I do not do a perfect job. 
So here in Maryland, an individual who is not covered otherwise by this section, that's lawyer stuff, don't worry about that, is not civilly liable for any act or omission in providing assistance or medical aid to a victim at the scene of an emergency. So emergencies, as we've discussed, that could be anything from a car accident to a shooting to a stabbing outside of a bar. Any other fun scenarios anyone can think of? So average Joe speak, meaning that someone encounters someone in some sort of medical distress, there is no legal requirement for them to take any action whatsoever. Correct. But if you do choose to take action, so long as what you do, the assistance or aid is provided in a reasonably prudent manner. So if a gentleman has a gunshot in his chest and uh, I start jumping up and down on his chest, that's probably not going to be reasonably imprudent. If he has a, you know, injury to his arm and uh, I decide, eh, well, you know, let's just remove the whole thing right or, here or and provide right now. Or provide him with a tracheotomy, you know. That yeah. Might, uh... yeah, that would not be reasonable or prudent. But as long as it's reasonable and prudent and key things here, once again, the assistance or aid is provided without fee or other compensation. So if I run up to the guy that's injured, not being a doctor, and I say, $200 and I'll help you, uh, you're getting yourself in trouble there. But if that happens and the individual re relinquishes care of the victim when someone who is licensed or certified by this state to provide medical care or services becomes available to take responsibility, then I am not going to be civilly liable for what I do as long as it checks all three boxes. So don't charge a fee. No gross negligence. And... Not e just it has to be reasonably prudent. Reasonable We're not even getting to gross negligence. Okay. Just it has to be reasonably prudent. Gotcha. So what six individuals... Don't exceed your level of training. Yes. Yes. So if you're trained to in basic first aid and you're doing advanced stuff that you have no idea about, but you saw a YouTube video, you're probably going to get hemmed up. So after I take your class, I should not be going around doing tracheotomies? Correct. All right, so no tracheotomies if you've not been trained in one or one is not warranted. Correct. Okay. Even if it's warranted, you better not be doing it unless you're trained to do that. So none of that stuff with a pen knife and a big pen. Correct. Okay. But if I come across someone who has a grievous leg wound... Probably, to, let's go to even to the mid-thigh. Right. And I apply a tourniquet, and he ends up losing that leg. He's not going to lose the leg. Tourniquets have been applied in operating rooms for years in excess of three, four hours. So that's interesting, because I remember when I was in the Scouts. Correct. Same the old, thing. Yeah, they used to say you can't, once you apply it, you can never take it off because the limb would be lost. Well, the verbiage that I was taught back in the day... And we're talking mid 60s. Okay. Again, dating myself was arm or um, life or limb. So you never put a tourniquet on them unless it's the case of life. They're going to lose the limb or they're going to lose their life. That's changed. I was going to say, do you agree with that statement still? Is that still a factual statement? Not necessarily. Tourniquets are appropriate for hemorrhagic bleeding, specifically what arterial. Bleeding? Specifically, arterial. No, well, what's that mean? I'm stupid. Lots and lots of blood. So let me ask you this, though. Is and, it and we talk about this in the class. You know, we'll show you what, you know, people donate blood every day. Okay. A pint of blood. Except for me. I keep my blood because yeah. I've worked very hard for it. <laughs> a pint I, of, I only do the plasma for the $20 right. once a month. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just to make ends meet. Yeah, of yeah. course. It's tough out here it's as a lawyer. It's tough out there yes. being a lawyer. Yes, yeah, especially in Baltimore, right? Yeah. No, it so, must be no terrible. business to be had. I know, right? So so the let me ask you this. Uh, if What if someone's not sure? What if somebody, uh, they're not sure if they see hemorrhagic bleeding? And okay. did I say that correctly? You did. Very good. So... Just what Andrew said, as long as you are acting in good faith, you're not going to get in trouble. Well, but let me ask you this. If someone applies a tourniquet, and it wasn't exactly necessary, but it does stop the flow of blood, is there still a likelihood that the limb would be saved? 
Yes. So, yeah. so when uh, in around, doubt, around this area, um, we have great hospitals. We have great ERs. You have very good medic crews that are going to be on the scene. We're talking about a very small window from the time the first situation or the first moments of the incident occurs until a police officer or an ambulance or a fire engine arrives on scene. In those few minutes, what can you do as a bystander or as a member of what's going on in this incident? What can you do to save your life or the life of another person? Well, I would think initially, and unless this was uh, assumed, is to start EMS. So to get right. the process rolling by calling for EMS. Right. And we have a, a little format that we talk about in class about what the sequence of events should be. Yes. The first, obviously, is, is the scene safe. Because if the scene is not safe and you start doing patient care, you're now jeopardizing yourself Right. The patient, bystanders. Right. So, scene safe? Yes. Go this way. No. Go this way. You know, I, I think decision maybe, tree, if you will. Correct. Absolutely. I think in flow charts. It's the way I was trained. So maybe uh, we could briefly just talk about what people are going to experience very briefly, at least in this area, when they call nine one one, and. I think a lot of people think that you call and you're just going to start yelling to the dispatcher that you need help at a certain whatever, and uh, that's how it's going to go. And, and so, at least in this area, most agencies utilize what's called emergency medical dispatch or EPD, emergency police dispatch, which is basically a scripted series of questions. Right. So, they're going to ask you things to the effect of, what's the location of the emergency? And they're going to ask you a second time to make sure that they have it correctly. Because what's more important, as long as they know where they need to go, they're sending help. Right. They'll ask you a second time to make sure that they got it correctly. Then they'll ask you for your contact phone number. So how, if you get disconnected, how can they get back in touch with you? And then the third question is gonna be, okay, tell me exactly what happened. I think people think that if they just try to rush through and say, I don't, I can't give you my phone number right now, this person, help is already coming. They're help, already dispatching. They're already dispatching while you're talking. Right. As soon as that 911 call is connected, they have your number that you're calling from that shows up on the screen, and they're going to start talking, and you can put your phone down next to the patient and be working on that patient or yourself if you're injured. Leaving the phone on, the dispatcher will be asking you questions, and you can tell them everything that's going on. And even prompting you as well. And people. prompting you because yep. those dispatchers are high-speed people. Yep. They've been trained, and not only that, but on their screens, they have certain sets of instructions for certain types of things. So what people should not uh, think that they have to just get everything out as quickly as they can and hang up the phone because help is already on the way from the moment that you're making that connected, you're connecting that call. And the dispatcher is going to have good information to help give you direction on what you may need to do. Now, I will say this. Depending on where you are, and we're talking about Maryland. Right, we're talking in the Baltimore metro region right. and the surrounding larger counties and right. stuff like that. Depending on where you are, the medic unit might be delayed because resources are limited, just like every other field in our lives. Right, right. right. We don't have enough nurses we don't have enough doctors we have more than enough lawyers but that's another story oh, we do too have many a lot lawyers of too many lawyers yes but when you dial 911 like you said that dispatcher's already in the process of sending a fire engine or a ladder truck or a squad or a police officer or somebody who's a trained professional rescuer with a little bit more knowledge perhaps than you have to help you out but you need to understand that you have to make that call or somebody, you know, put your people around you, put them to work. Everybody's got a phone or all videotaping. Ask one of them to please call 911 if you don't have a phone on you. One thing that I remember from some training I received was when you're telling somebody, like you said, put people to work. When you're telling someone, hey, go call 911 and then come back to me. If, if they had right. to leave the scene. Now, if they're at the scene, call 911, stay on the phone with them, stay right here. If they had to go to get a phone, because, I mean, uh, everyone has a cell phone now, but if you're in an area where they had to go to get a phone, go call and come back and tell me you did. 
because the last thing you want to do is tell some onlooker, some gawker, say, go call 911. And they go, I'm not doing that. And they walk away and they right. leave. And then we're like, where's the medics? They never, they never I don't, I don't want to be involved in this situation. Exactly. So, so go call and then come back either with them on the line or tell me that you did call and that they're on the way. Right. And we go through all this in the class yeah. about the proper language you should use and the, the information that the dispatcher is going to solicit from you. Right. Where can I get this training? Well, go to uh, the website. yeah, we you can go to the Urban Defense website. Uh, we offer this every other month. Um, so during uh, the year, we offer our regular firearms courses, our certification courses uh, every other month. So our uh, other months are, so January in this case and March are going to be our electives. So our electives are the force on force and the emergency trauma care. So they can go to the Urban Defense website. They can go to classes and scroll down and they'll find this class. They'll find a bio about Jerry. They'll find my bio. They'll find out information about this class. It's not expensive and, and it's a great way to prepare yourself for the potential of being involved in a tra traumatic incident. Cool. All right, so Mr. Producer, you have an answer. What does it say? As far as sucking the venom out of a snake bite, it doesn't work. Sucking the venom out can cause the poison to spread to the mouth and the extractor pumps found in the snake snake kits don't work any better than your mouth. Studies have found that the most common extractor pumps uh, extract bloody fluid, but virtually no venom. So, and cutting it out will cause uh, more tissue damage and blood loss. So, there's our answer. Don't yeah, delay. How, how get we to rabbit, the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. How we rabbit trailed down there, I don't know. Well, Come was, on, man. we talked about yeah. it. He was going to look it up because <laughs> yeah. I was I was curious myself. Yeah, I was right, like, right. what what do you what do you do with that? Because, and again, I want to say in scouts, I think it was talking about you would apply uh, some sort of uh, like a tourniquet type thing and elevate the wound. I think was that what they used well, to teach? Uh, they, that's, that's another, another myth. myth. Oh, yeah. so so Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, Correct. So he says it, it, that apparently he found also does more damage. And you got to think about this. In this area, and what's the likelihood of us being exposed to, what, what are they, three, three or four poisonous snakes Yeah, I think you have copperheads and water moccasins. Rattlesnake. And are, are there rattlesnakes in, in Maryland? The like western, western part Maryland. of the Maryland. Yeah. I don't you know, the think reason I don't go out there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think. Shock it. Yeah. Okay, so shocking with ice or electricity is also not recommended. It would deactivate. deactivate. That's what they said. It would deactivate the ven venom, but that is not true. Okay, so don't do any of those things. Did you know that, Jerry? I did. <clears throat> well, but, then you could have told but, us yeah. that. Well, I'm, I'm, I thought you were joking. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you were curious. I, thought I was you were curious. Around, man. You're, um, you're the expert. Yeah. Right? I'm the lawyer. I don't know yeah, anything. That's right. Yeah. So I'm right. not sucking the poison. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so going back to the beginning part before I, I hijacked and started talking about the phone call and everything. So you said the most important thing, again, securing the scene, getting EMS started. And the, the, to the original question was, what if you're not sure if the person needs a tourniquet? If you apply one and you save their life, great. It's better to do that than it is to not apply one and have them bleed to death. Correct. So thoughts on that? Is that a fairly so factual I, I statement? would agree. Look, if you're going to make a mistake, make it on the side of being conservative. So if you're not sure what a lot of blood looks like, for example, if you cut your finger, you know how much blood is going to come out of your finger, right? Right. But a scalp cut, scalp's highly vascular. It's going to look like a lot of blood. You obviously can't put a tourniquet on the person's so you don't put a tourniquet around the person's neck correct unless you don't like that right. person okay but, and we'll go through all that in the class but will that Learn stop something but, new but will <laughs> that stop the bleeding yeah. so we go to other methods direct right. pressure things like that right. elevate and, right well, oh, well, put ice on it I'm so sorry. direct pressure and wound packing in areas where you can apply tourniquets and stuff right. like that and right. we go over the proper application we won't do that here but we'll, right. we go over during the class or jerry goes over the proper application of tourniquets and stuff so we were talking about legal jeopardy and i know because he told me that andrew has a couple things that he wanted to talk about some cases and things like that well, it's well established here in Maryland that self-defense exists. All the time I have people say, I mean, there's no self-defense law. Uh, well, we have case law that provides for self-defense. And there have been numerous instances where uh, individuals have 
properly applied self-defense, reasonably so. And then, of course, unfortunately, they're still charged with crimes and have to defend themselves. And as a criminal defense practitioner, I would love it if we can bolster our arguments of defense if first aid was then applied uh, to the individual who was shot, even okay. in self-defense. And uh, obviously we hear the jokes, you know, oh, if uh, you shoot them once and uh, they're crawling away, well, shoot them a couple times and drag them back inside. Right, and don't, like don't that. do that, by the way. Yeah, do not do that. Or if they've gotten outside, well, drag them back in. Yeah, don't do that either, but yes. Things of that nature. And it would only help your case if first aid was rendered. I've had very... Unf and for every case where it's going to be an individual in the middle of the night breaking into your house, it's either going to be other self-defense instances where it's not going to be an unknown assailant, where it's not going to be um, a scary mugger with a mask on. And unfortunately, a lot of times it may be someone you know. And also, we all know the tragedies that have happened where we think it's the unknown mugger breaking into the house but instead it's your long-lost uncle who uh, lost his phone and just happened to be in the neighborhood and was uh, remembered that's where you lived and was coming trying to uh, get help. So you can't go wrong with rendering first aid. And going back to the Good Samaritan statute, you, you would be protected from civil liability as long as you're acting reasonably. So you're, in your opinion, and as, a, as an attorney someone that uses self-defense, uh, let's say a firearm or uses some sort of force in self-defense, and then when once the scene is safe and there's no longer a threat, then attempts to render aid to that person that they used force on would only be helpful to them provided that they're using an appropriate, reasonable type of care. Absolutely. It can show a lack of malice, a lack of premeditation, things of that nature where if I'm charged with first-degree murder, despite what we're going to contend is a lawful use of self-defense, if I'm attempting, really, I wanted to kill them, why would I try and render aid? In Maryland, also, we now have two Good Samaritan statutes. We also have the second one that applies now. Um, if, while may not be what was the uh, lovely big word you used? Uh, hemor hemorrhagic. 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 <laughs> But in Maryland now, if you have an individual um, that is overdosing on drugs or alcohol or any combination thereof that may be obtained legally, if you're some 16-year-old kids and one of your friends gets so drunk that now they have alcohol poisoning, did you ever encounter that, Jerry, mm -hmm. during sure. your times? Oh, yeah. Um, in Maryland now, and there back in the day when I was younger, I'm sure there would have been a concern of, oh, my gosh, uh, Jimmy's drunk and... That really would never ha happen. Yeah, never producer Jimmy. And he's really suffering, but we don't want to call for help because the cops are going to come here and find all this booze, and then we're going to be in trouble too. Uh, but now we have a second statute here in Maryland that in that instance, you could not be criminally prosecuted if the police only obtain the evidence as a result of you calling... 911 or something of that nature. So don't be scared to do that when you're concerned about your own potential criminal liability. And we see countless cases of overdoses, unfortunately, all throughout the area where someone is using heroin that has a uh, not safe amount of fentanyl in it. And now they're, have you ever encountered those? Oh, yeah. You know, 20 years ago, you didn't have these accidental exposures to these substances now it's become commonplace and you know you have to be able to pick up the signs and symptoms of a overdose in order to adequately treat the person but without training you're not going to know absolutely and so. if you're in a situation where now in maryland even if you were on probation or parole, and a condition of your probation and parole is not to use illegal substances, but if you're in a situation and someone has overdosed, 
you can call 911 without fear of criminal prosecution. No longer have to have the movie trope of driving by the hospital real quick and throwing them out the back door of the moving car. Yeah, I hope somebody finds them. Yeah. Andrew, have you, uh, or to both of you, have either of you in your memory, do you remember any instances where someone actually used uh, some sort of emergency trauma care on someone inappropriately and was prosecuted or found guilty in one way or another? Have you, either of you come across anything like that? I, I would imagine it's not very commonplace. Um, Most often what I've seen is people are afraid to get involved there for a go. number of reasons. Yeah. They lack the training. They lack self-confidence. They're concerned about litigation. Concerned about being exposed to something. Correct. And so it's, it's not so much where they're putting a tracheotomy in someone with a paper cut. It's that someone is having massive bleeding and they're like, I just don't want to get involved. Right. Now, I have seen a uh, number of times, actually, go into a adult beverage establishment. No where, one would ever do that. No. Where people It was are, empty. <laughs> they're doing CPR on somebody who got drunk and passed out, and they're now straddling their chest and pumping on their abdomen, saying, I'm doing CPR. And no, you're not. You're causing a problem. You're not fixing the problem. So... Just to kind of wrap up, we talked about why what we do now in emergency trauma care is so different from what was done in the past, how uh, everything has evolved from the vehicles to the equipment to the tactics and then the different things that we do, uh, how that's evolved. We've talked about the class. We've talked about uh, little snippets of what's in that class and why it's important. We talked about the uh, fact that it's a perishable skill, that it's something that you're going to need to do over. It is a perishable skill. Um, and people don't really know how they're going to react in an emergency until they've been in an emergency. Yes. So one of the things that I look at is the more training you have, the more confident you're going to be and probably the more willing you are to participate in patient care. Now, that's on somebody else. If you yourself sustain an injury, whatever it might be, and you have a little bit of training, you'll be able to control yourself, hopefully. You know, start your self-care, you know. We're not talking about buddy care. We're talking about self-care. And you could potentially save your own life. Yeah, the life you save yeah. may just be your own. Correct. And so training in a stressful environment because doing something in a calm classroom setting can be different than operating under stress, which is why we brought from the law enforcement realm into the civilian realm, the uh, force on force reality based training, where we <clears throat> where we actually put people into stressful situations. Now, there's not a medical component to that class at the moment, but it's very interesting. And we talked about it in the very beginning. It's, it was very interesting to see that even people that you would expect are going to be very high speed based on their, their firearms proficiency, how they can tend to freeze right. because you've placed them, they get that hesitation because you've placed them into that stressful environment, something that they're not familiar with. Right. Um, so training is important. Uh, legal aspect, we've covered that. Um, you know, you're not placing yourself in legal jeopardy as long as you're acting within the scope of your training. You're not acting unreasonably or maliciously. Anything else to add? So I've always said that there are two types of people. People who have been involved in critical incidents and people who are going to be involved in critical incidents. Eventually, it crosses your path. Unless you're going to sit in your house on your couch with the shades drawn, bad things happen. That's, that's part of life. And the question is... How prepared are you to meet it? Right. right. So with that said, for Urban Defense Podcast, I'm Dwayne Urban, along with Andrew Saller and Jerry Hines. I want to encourage you to remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, train, fight, and win.